and you're on. Ladies and gentlemen of America, Ryan Bundy joins you on your lunch break today, live from his maximum security cell, because we have left him there. But Ryan, you are here to talk to us today about the the specific abusers at the CCA facility. Funded by your tax dollars, America, you're paying for this, you Republicans and you Democrats and all you people that just let other people supposedly take care of your liberty, this is where it all ends up eventually. But you wanted to talk uh, today, Ryan, about the 13th Amendment and everything that's going on with the strip searches that you and Ammon are being subjected to. And they're playing mind games with your brother. They're telling him that you've given up and you've surrendered and these guys are these these guys are the terrorists here well before I go into that I have a, 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 a story I want to tell and, and it will lead right into to that discussion that we just announced so okay. if you guys will uh, you guys will uh, bear with me for a moment I'll, I'll go through this now I'd like you to tell. I'd like to tell you that this story is true. It's not a fabrication. I participated in it. This is me that's telling this story you now. Now, before I go into the story, I need to give a little bit of background to lay a foundation. Now, the story I'm, I'm calling it the Brave Little Lamb. And first of all, people need to know that sheep are not brave animals. They don't fight back when attacked. When in danger, they just run to, with the greatest of fear and try to escape. They tuck their heads into the flock, trying to hide themselves at the expense of whoever else is on the outside. They never face their fears. That's just sheep. Second of all, sheep almost always give birth to twins. Sometimes three or four or even five. But seldom do sheep give birth to just one. Twins are the norm. I don't know why that is, it's just the way God created them, and most of the time, sheep have twins. It's kind of interesting. Third of all, in our corral, at our ranch, we have two large basil trees. Now, these trees grow fast, and they grow tall, and they provide good shade for the animals in the corral. But these trees have little integrity. They grow fast, but not strong. They are often breaking down in a strong wind or when their weight outgrows their strength. Uh, my story begins with the crash of one of these big trees into our corral, a common occurrence that usually does damage to the corral and creates a mess that needs to be cleaned up. This call is from an inmate facility. This particular branch of the tree had fallen into the entrance of the corral from one of our fields that cows and sheep use as pasture. At the time, we had some sheep there. The fallen tree did not completely prevent the sheep from coming in, but they had to jump through the branches to get in or out. The branch had been down for some time, so I decided that today would be a good day to clean it up. So I headed to the corral with the chainsaw. I climbed up into the tree to strategically take it apart from the top down for safety and efficiency. Now, the little band of sheep we had were in the corral, quietly asleep in the shade of the tree when I began my work. I started the chainsaw and cut the first branch, which came crashing down into the ground, closing off the exit even tighter. The sheep went berserk. They all jumped up from their sleep and began running around the corral trying to find another way out. Having none, one old ewe headed for the fallen tree and through the branches um, to get out to out, out free to the pasture. The rest of the flock quickly followed. I watched and waited and gave them a little time and a chance to get out before I cut my next branch. A few of the little lambs had a hard time overcoming their fear to go through the branches, but all of them made it, except for one. He was now all alone and just could not bring himself to go through that tree that had just fallen from the sky with the noise of the scary chainsaw and a mighty crash. Alone and closed off from his family, he bawled in fear, and he ran around the corral trying to find a way out. A few times he approached the fallen tree but just could not find the courage 
within him to go through the branches. I was perched in the tree directly overhead watching all of this and waiting patiently for him to find his way. The little lamb, in terrible fear, he bleated for help, but all the other sheep were gone, safe in the pasture. But then, from behind me, back from the field, back from safety, back into danger, came another little lamb, his twin brother, I assume. This little lamb came right up into the danger, bleeding for his brother. He went right up to the fallen tree to bring his brother safely out. Getting the attention of the trapped little lamb, he encouraged him. Seeing and hearing his brother through the branches, the little lamb finally gained the courage he needed to go through the fallen branches. Together, they run like hell to the safety of the pasture. Before I started my work, and I pondered for a moment the bravery of this second little lamb. The bravery that this lamb must have had to come back into the danger to rescue his brother. Do animals have love for one another? It appeared that this one did. This little lamb had nothing to gain for himself self, by going back into the danger zone. He had already gone through it and was safe with the flock, far from the noise in the falling tree, far from harm's way. But he went against his own nature as a fearful creature to go rescue his brother. He knew that he could not conquer the tree nor the chainsaw, and he surely did not understand This call it. is from an inmate facility. For what was really happening, but still he came, still he came. And by coming, he was able to give his brother the courage he needed to make it through the danger so that he could be safe, too. That story, that took place in, in 1990. Now I want to tell you another true story. A story about my brother Ammon. This story began in the fall of 2015 and is still going on today. This is a story of a very successful man. Everything he touched seemed to turn to gold. Ammon had built a very successful business. He had numerous employees. He married a lovely wife and had six beautiful children. He owned more than one home worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. He owned an apple orchard growing a special variety of apples. He was happy, safe, and successful. Prominent, productive, and prosperous. He had gone through the travails of life to acquire this place, and he was safe in his pasture, so to speak. But then he heard the cry of his brothers, Dwight and Stephen Hammond, who he had never met. They were in peril. Their world was crashing down around them. Hammond at first said to himself, I am busy. I don't have time. I have work enough for myself to do. I don't want to get involved. But then the Spirit of the Lord rested upon him and said, Learn all that you can about the Hammonds. Hammond stayed up all of that night reading everything he could find about the Hammonds. He learned lives. The Lord said to Hammond regarding what was being done to the Hammonds, I am not well pleased. So Ammon went against human nature to preserve just himself, and he went into the danger zone to help his brothers. The problem with this story is that the ones who are causing the world to crash do not care about life or liberty of the Hammonds nor Ammon. They are not waiting for them to get to safety. Instead, they design to trap and to destroy all lambs. Neither Ammon nor the Hammonds have made it to safety yet. I do not know what the Hammonds are going through, but Ammon, they are giving hell. These beasts do not like a rescuer. They despise them the most. Ammon is being treated with a horde of inhumanities. The latest is a complete disregard for his religious beliefs to be morally clean and modest. They forcefully strip him naked and throw him in a cell without clothing sexually assaulting him by pornographically filming the stripping and saying they want to watch him shower naked. They are violating many of his rights more than just this. 
Hammond had nothing to gain for himself. By In the event a third-party call is detected, your call will be terminated <clears throat> without warning. Hammond had nothing to gain for himself by coming to help the Hammonds. Nothing. But still he came. Still he came. The same can be said for the many who came to the Bundys to help the Bundys and to protect the people in 2014. These men also are heroes. These men are deserving of medals of honor. Medals of honor, not prosecution for fabricated crimes they did not commit. Theirs also is a story of love and bravery in the face of great danger. It is time this for the rest is from an inmate facility. It is time for the rest of the flock to muster the courage to stand up for what is right, to go against the nature of self preservation to save not only their brothers, but ultimately them themselves and their freedom. There comes a time when men must for righteousness' sake, make their choices based upon correct principles rather than upon self-preservation or for their paycheck. Who's on the Lord's side who, I ask? Now is the time to show. We ask it fearlessly, who's on the Lord's side who? Choose the right, let the consequence follow. Battle for freedom in spirit and might. And with stout hearts, Looking forward till tomorrow. For God will In the event a third party call is detected, your call will be terminated without warning. God will protect you in doing what's right. So well, that's my story. We need to stop being sheep. Yeah, we need to stop being sheep. We need to stop being sheep. And uh, it's time that we uh, we gather that courage that we need to stand up. I don't know what animal we want to refer, or, you know, liken ourselves unto, but not sheep. Nope. Nope. Not sheep. We hear a lot of uh, uh, we hear a lot of talk about sheep dogs out there, but. I don't see very many. I see a lot of guys, a lot the sheepdogs are locked up in prison. That's a fact. Those that come to the aid of well, people in need, doing the jobs of sheriffs across this land, they're the ones locked up. So those of us that aren't locked up, we have a task to do. And it's not nearly as scary when people show up together. When we are united, we have the power. Yes, you do. Anyway, anyway, I can't tell anybody what to do. They've got to listen to the Spirit of the Lord, and they've got to act. But they've got to repent and be in a position where they can receive that guidance from God. They can't hear Him if they're not listening. And they're not listening if they're not listening to God. If they're not, if they're not obeying His commandments then they're not in a position to hear. And so that's always, I always make that a part of my presentation, just to make sure that people are turning towards God and repenting. It's for their own good. It's for their own sake, as well as ours. We need them. We need them to come rescue us. But they, they've they got to be on firm ground themselves before they can do so. Now, as far as talking about the atrocities that are going on in here, particularly against Ammon, I don't have a, a prepared or an outlined speech. Um, there's a lot of subjects we can cover. I can tell you more or less what's going on, and maybe we can discuss the parameters of that. Just uh, so um, that... Maybe you want to start out by questioning. So the audience understands, the media will tell us you're resisting which wouldn't be bad anyway, but the, the, the fact is you're not resisting. What you are saying is we're not going to take our clothes off for you. If you're going to put a gun in our face and remove our clothes, I'm not going to die over my shirt today. But you got, but that's where they're at. They want you to strip naked. They're doing this to break you down, to humiliate you. Ammon was in the bowels of the courthouse last week, strip searched three times, 
and he never made it into Judge Navarro's courtroom. So that was just harassment. That was strictly abuse. Well, you know, I'd like to go over. Let's let's talk about. Let's start here for a minute. I want to talk in general about the the first ten amendments to the the Constitution. We call those the Bill of Rights. Now, if you would look at those. Okay. Half of those, half of the Bill of Rights, half of our first ten amendments have to do with protecting those who are accused of crimes. I find that quite interesting. Very, very interesting. Because of all the things that our founding fathers were doing, they were forming, they were creating, forming a, a, a new government a government that's supposed to protect people. And they were so concerned about those who are accused of crimes that half of our, our, our Bill of Rights is designed to protect the accused. That says a whole heck of a lot. That says a lot. Why was it so important to our founding fathers to protect those who are accused of crimes? Because, because they had either experienced or witnessed such great abuses against people who were accused before yes. they were forming this government. People should okay. people listening to this, if you're not familiar with the Declaration of Independence, that was their redress of grievances. Everything in the Declaration of Independence was supposed to be solved by the Constitution of the United States. And we're going through it again. We're going through it again. And you have one minute remaining. I'm going to have to, anyway, interestingly enough, you know, we didn't have to go through a war. You know, these 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 men, they, they declared their independence, and they and they showed why. They listed uh, 28, 27 reasons in the Declaration of Independence why they were separating themselves from from England. And uh, and it's interesting that many of those, many of those were were, is from an inmate facility. were incurring those same things from federal government now. Those who do not know their history will be doomed to repeat it. And we are. We literally have the king's men doing what they want, going where they want. Your time is up. Ryan Bundy will be calling back. Stick with us here. Thanks for joining us. Share the message. Try to get a hold of your county sheriff. See if he'll tune in right now because we need the man that's supposed to protect our property rights, the chief law executive in the county, to do his job. Local police doesn't work for the federal government. They're supposed to protect the people that vote for them, fund their pensions, and pay them to do a certain work. Protecting life, liberty, and property. That is the only legitimate role of government. Anything more than that is going to lead to problems and slavery and poverty and ridiculous people. Freedom's not that complicated. Nowadays, you need a license for everything. You need permission for everything. And there's somebody with a gun to make sure you comply. That's not very nice. Ryan Bundy, Hello. welcome back. This is an Amtel operator with a prepaid collect call from... Ryan Bundy. Tax dollars at work. To accept this prepaid collect call, press 1. To decline this call, press 2. All Cor phone calls are subject I'll press to monitoring one. and recording. You have $92.65. Thank you for using Amtel. Ryan Bundy, welcome back. Uh, people across the land uh, say they wish you were sheriff. <laughs> well, get me out. Absolutely. In a position. I will serve well. Absolutely. So, okay, so back to the back to these amendments. It's so important that our founding fathers uh, protect those who are accused because they saw how the accused are are, are abused and treated. Uh, the Great Britain, the king, they, they abused the accused. They they treated them as though they were not 
not meant, they, as though they had no rights. And so our founding fathers specifically said, you know, the accused shall have enjoy the right to this and shall enjoy the right to that. And no person, you know, held to answer for crimes shall be, you know, thus and thus and thus. Twice, and so, yeah, twice was, put in jeopardy. Yeah, there's there's many things in here. There's many things in here. You know, the 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 uh, the Fourth Amendment. You know, it says the right of the people. Now that doesn't specify that it's the accused only, but it definitely in includes the accused. You know, shall be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures, and this shall not be violated. No warrant shall be issued but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly, particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. And yet, Congress has gone about and made, I, I don't, Ammon has the number down exactly, he told me, I don't remember it, I think it's like 638 exceptions, 638 exceptions to the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment is, you know, three quarters of an inch thick on a little pocket held book, and yet they make 636 of, uh, 38 exemptions to that. It's amazing. And those are supposed to trump the supreme law of the land, Article 6. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's interesting how almost every law has an exemption, exception exception okay you know simply the uh, the commandment to um, keep the Sabbath day holy has an exception we call that the ox in the mire you know if your ox fell in a hole in a mud pit are you going to leave him there to die just simply because it's the Sabbath no you're going to pull him out but the exception is the exception it's not the rule the problem is, is that oftentimes when there is an exception, then everybody wants to rely on the exception, and then it becomes the rule, and the rule is forgotten. And that's what's happening to our Constitution, not just this Fourth Amendment, but to all of them. We're making all these exceptions. You know, the, the Sixth Amendment, it says in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury. It says enjoy the right to a speedy trial. And who does it say that belongs to? It says that belongs to the accused. It doesn't belong to the general population at that point. Not until you're accused do you enjoy the right. It doesn't belong to Congress. They can't interpret it. It doesn't belong to the court. The court can't tell you how it's going to work. It doesn't belong to the prosecution. It belongs to the accused. But I don't want to go down that road so much. I want to stick closer to the Fourth Amendment and the violations that are being placed upon upon Ammon particularly. Let us, um, yeah, let's, let's get into it. Uh, who's this Captain Genie guy? Okay, well let me, let me, let me go a little bit further here. Okay, the, the other right that's being completely ignored is that we are supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. Innocent. That's the American standard. That's the standard by which all of this is put together, is that a man is not guilty until he is proven beyond a reasonable doubt that he has committed a crime. And until such time, he is to be considered innocent. Now, the question I have here is where in the world is that? I don't see it happening to us. They treat us exactly the same they do as every guilty person in here. There is no innocence until proven guilty. They claim there is. They say it with their words, but they do not. Who is an innocent man? who is a productive man, who is a, a successful man, who is a, an honorable man, who has a wife and children, who has a business, he who is, has, has a home. He's an unconvicted man. Unconvicted. Unconvicted. And yet they treat him with such degradation. It's just, it's embarrassing to this nation. 
embarrassing to this country that they would treat a man like that. I don't believe they should treat the guilty men in such a bad way. But under the 13th Amendment, we did mention it here. And by the way, I want to bring this up. Ever, anyone in, the, in America who believes that slavery is not legal in America, you are strongly in the wrong. Slavery is alive and well in America, and it's legal. This call is from an inmate facility. And the 13th Amendment says so. I'm going to read it. It says, Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. Okay, there's the exception again. So when is slavery and involuntary servitude legal? It's after a person has been duly convicted of a crime. Duly convicted. And then they make slaves out of these men. And they, and they make slaves right. out of people for crimes that aren't really crimes. Anything can be illegal. Yes. Eating bologna on Wednesday can be a crime. Right. Illegal, I should say. Well, a crime's not. It no can't victim. be a crime. It can be illegal. Right, right, yes, <laughs> yes. Lots of things are illegal. But that doesn't make it unlawful. No. There's a difference between lawful and legal. No victim. I'm not going to go down that road either. No victim, no crime. And uh, the ox would thank you for pulling him out of the muck. Yes. Okay. So there is a difference between lawful and legal. Now, um, again, back to Ammon. He has, he is an innocent man. He retains all of his rights. They have detained him because they claim that he is a danger to society and that he's a flight risk. And so they employ a private facility, and it doesn't matter whether it was a jail run by a government or whether it's this private CCA, um, core civic, it doesn't matter. Either way, they've imprisoned him because of their false claims, unsubstantiated by fact. But they claim that he's a danger to society. And with that, um, this facility has one obligation and one obligation only. And that's to ensure that he's at trial at the proper time and place. Because why? Because they think he's a flight risk. And so they place him in jail so that they make sure that he'll be there. That's their only objective. That's their only legal objective. But they've taken it upon themselves to believe that it's their objective to subject him to all their, their, their wills and their wishes. And they want to strip search him. Now, Ammon has stood his ground. And let me let me talk about these strip searches a little bit. And it's going to be a little bit graphic, so those with tender ears might want to cover them. But they they force us to strip completely naked in front of in front of other men. And their policy even allows for it to be the opposite sex. They want us to shake our testicles in front of them, and bend over and spread our cheeks and expose our anus so that they can peer up into it. Of course, then they want us to open our mouths and make sure we don't have anything in our under our tongue or in our cheeks. And uh, they want us to show us every part, show them every part of our body. And you guys and have been... Say that this is for, you guys have been completely shut off from the outside world for 18 months. The only way you could even have anything is if the guards gave it to you. Well, and then they, they claim that, oh, well, your attorney or your paralegal can bring it in. And so then they want to strip us, um, strip us then. Um, and, I, and let me just go down that road a little bit. An attorney or a paralegal, these these people that are supposed to be helping, number one, they're considered officers of the court. So they're not really people from the outside. Number two, if they really want to stop 
um, contraband or whatever they want to call it from coming in, why don't they stop it at the door? Why don't they search the attorneys and paralegals before they come in instead of allowing them to bring stuff in and then searching us afterwards? They, they, they act as if we, because we're in here in, in these incarcerated, that we have no rights. But the attorney somehow does. Well, let's, let's question that a little bit. Where does the attorney get his rights? Okay, now I'm not talking he himself. He, he of himself has his own rights, correct. But as an attorney, he does not. As an attorney, he is representing Ammon. Mm -hmm. And so the only reason he has any mm -hmm. rights at all is because he inherits those or derives them from Ammon. If Ammon has no rights, then the attorney has no rights. So if he's coming in here to visit Ammon and he has a right to come and visit him because he's representing him, then his rights in that capacity derive from Ammon. But somehow or another, the jail, and I, don't know, I know it's not just this one, it's all across the country. Oh, no, that doesn't count. That doesn't mean anything. Hammond's a prisoner. He has no rights. We'll strip him naked, and if he says no, we'll beat him. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll go in there with six, eight men to, to force him, and, and they will literally rip the clothes off his back, take him off with a pair of scissors to strip him down. Sickos. 100% and, sickos. And they claim it's for safety. Oh, it's for the safety of the facility. It's for the safety of the staff and the other inmates. We will negate your personal and, and individual rights for the security of the whole. Do you know what that is? That is communism. That is communism. And people need to need to think about this for a second. These rights that each one of us have are individual rights. The community does not have rights. Individuals have rights. God created man, and he gave each one of them individually rights. Now, if the rights of the individual are protected and secured, then automatically the rights of the whole are protected and secured. But when you go about trying to protect and secure the rights of the community, then the individual rights are, are left behind and they are forgotten, and individuals' rights matter not. Individuals can be destroyed, and it doesn't matter because all oh, the group is, is safe. When that when and, and 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 too long in America we have been preaching, oh we gotta do this for the good of the community, we gotta do this for the good of the country, we gotta do this for the good of this, or, you know, the greater good. BS. There is no greater good than to protect the right of the individual. There is no greater good than to protect the right of the individual. And when each individual's rights are protected then the rights of the community are protected automatically without thought. Communism is the effort to try to protect the rights of the community and they forget the individual. Well, that's a lie, but yeah, that's what they say. That's the lie they use. And that's what they tell that's us. That's the lie that they use. Yes. Well, and, and it's been preached. I remember learning about that even when I was in kindergarten and in, in, in kindergarten. That's why public schools are there. Very that that thinking has led to the deaths of a hundred million people over the last century. It's well, and, and theft. Here's the other. Here's the other thought to think. Safety. You know, we hear safety first. So oh, was we safety? Oh, you know, public safety. You know, Department of you know, Department of Public Safety or safety this or safety that. We lose more freedoms in the name of safety than any other thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got to make our community safe. Oh, we got to do this for safety. Oh, well, it's it's the safe thing to do. Well, it's a, it's we an lose easy more freedoms. Yes, 
Go ahead. It, well, it's an easy argument to, you don't like safety. You don't like safe kids. You don't like safe neighbors. And if we don't recognize the lie when we hear it, we're contributing to the problem. Well, what did Benjamin Franklin say concerning security? Those, yes. He said, those who sacrifice liberty for security deserve and receive neither. Now, I don't know if I quote that exactly. I think I need to find that and then learn it exactly. Close but enough. That that's, 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 yes. Close enough. Yes. It's absolutely true. Those who, those who sacrifice liberty for security receive neither. Because once your liberty is gone, then your security is also gone. And yet, and yet, that's exactly what they're trying to do here in this jail with this strip search. Oh, it's for your safety and for ours, they say. It's for your safety and for ours. This call is from an inmate facility. And they try to convince us that that we need to strip naked and do their little porno dance in front of them so that we can all be happy and safe. When in reality, it has nothing to do with safety, and it has everything to do with subjug subjugation, with breaking us down. Now, you know, perhaps, perhaps <clears throat> the first time someone's brought in off the streets, who knows what he has, perhaps maybe one time would be justifiable coming in. But these guys in here, and this, particularly this jail, more, more so than the other places that we've spent time, they want to strip three, four times more often. Well, let, let me ask you this. How often do they find anything? Well, I know that on me they've never found anything. I've been stripped over a hundred times, and I have heard, and I do not have this, you know, for fact, but I, I so I'm just speaking off the the top of my head here, but I think that CCA here at this facility has been in business here for 15 years or something of the sort, 12, 15 years, and I've heard that in the entire time they've only found, only twice have found anything on somebody, only twice. And, and what was it? Was it a knife or was it drugs? I have no idea. I have no idea. Uh, um, yeah, if it's drugs in your butt, I don't care. I don't know how you're going to get a knife. Yeah. It's stupid. Don't tell the people yeah. that if you know people in this industry, tell them to repent and get a real job. FedEx is hiring. A lot of people yeah. are hiring. Don't don't do this for a living. This is you thought the airports were well, bad. Well, you know, um, when it comes to when it comes to security, you know, again, this is where individuals involved is is some individuals you have one minute remaining the history of, of drug use or repeated you know violent you know occurrences or um, you know or they've been in and out of jail a hundred times and they're bringing you know stuff in I mean you know maybe those type of people might need to be searched more but consider who Ammon is Again, a family man, a businessman. He, I mean, he doesn't have a criminal history. I and mean, you know, of course, these guys want to apply communism again and say, "Oh, well, we got to treat everybody the same. It doesn't matter who you are. You're, you know, we're treating you the same." In other words, it doesn't matter whether you're innocent, you're guilty, or or, or anything at all. This is communism, and this is how communism works. These these guys know very well what they're doing to you, sir. They know we're very well. About what they're doing. I suppose uh, Ryan will call back to finish up the next segment. What are your thoughts? Leave some comments here. I think if you have drugs in your anus, that's uh, your business and I, not my problem. Not, not my problem. And I don't know how you'd get a switchblade up there anyway. And Prisons are an abomination. It is another form of slavery. Either the taxpayer pays for it Either the taxpayer pays for it. With a prepaid collect call from...
or yeah, uh, the taxpayer to pays for it. Prepaid collect call, press one. To declare all phone calls are subject to monitoring and recording. You, you pay have for it. eighty-eight dollars forty-five cents. Thank you for using Amtel. Anyway, uh, we're back online. Yes, sir. All right. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, uh, religious freedom. You know, that again is supposed to be protected by the First Amendment. And we all know that fairly well, but it says Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or the prohibitation or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Establishing religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now, Emma and I, we belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And in that church, we teach a high moral standard. We have what we call the law of chastity. The law of chastity is that No, you shall have no sexual relation with anyone except your husband or your wife to whom you are legally and lawfully wed. And that includes a high moral code of, of dress, not to be exposing yourself, and that nakedness should only be uncovered by your spouse and no one else. And we make certain covenants to the Lord in the Holy Temple, including that and, and other things. And we are clothed in a, in a holy garment that is supposed to remind us of our covenants, remind us of our, our obligations to our Father in Heaven and to our spouses. Same, same kind of, a, yeah, the same kind of garments that Moses gave to Aaron. That's right. And this is a sacred thing. This is a sacred thing. And we promise to wear that garment throughout our lives, always. Now, we do have these garments here with us. And I am grateful that they were able to come in and they were, and we were able to have them because they take everything from you when you come in. They do strip you naked and take everything from you. And so I do feel blessed that we have our, our temple garments with us. But now to these strip searches, they want to oftentimes remove them and view us. And, it, and we endured it for quite some time. We endured it to the point that it become, it become over the top, become too much. Again, as I, as I mentioned, up there in Oregon, we were there for nine months. They did strip searches there occasionally, but not very often, not very often. We went through eight weeks of trial every day to the courthouse and back, never strip searched, never strip searched. I think one time out of eight weeks. We had numerous visits with our attorneys, and, yes, sometimes we were strip searched and sometimes this not. This call is from an inmate facility. We moved about the facility, and we were not strip searched very often. We were strip searched some, but not very often. But you get down here to Nevada Southern Detention Center of Core Civic, and they strip at least four times more often. Now, I've been strip searched more than 100 times. But down here, if we went by NSDC's policy, if we went to trial and it's anticipated that our trial is going to last, you know, probably 12 weeks, and if we had a few attorney visits um, in the midst of, of the trial, if we were strip searched according to NSDC's policy, I'd be strip searched 255 times during trial. 255 times. I might as well just run around naked and not put my clothes on at all. Yeah. Okay. And that is not appropriate. 
it's not necessary. It's not necessary for the security of the facility. It's not necessary for the security of the court. It's not necessary for my security. Have you? That is complete degradation. Ryan, have you ever had guards come to you and say, hey, we're not going to do this. We'll just pretend we did? Me? Yes. You know, we'll say we, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll not say we did, you know, or, you know, or whatever. Yes, we've had that. So. Well, that's good. Okay. Um, but with the over excessive strip searching that this facility does, it just it became too much, and finally we said no more. Now both Ammon and I made that decision in late January, and since late January till now except for the times we've been forced to be stripped, we haven't voluntarily stripped. Now, this has put a damper on our visits with, uh, with legal counsel, with attorneys, paralegals, etc., which we have a right to do. So basically what they're trying to, to do is make us choose between rights. We're either going to violate your Fourth Amendment right to be secure in your person's papers and effects of things by stripping you out naked, or we're going to violate your right to the assistance of counsel in meeting with your attorneys, or we're going to avoid, you know, violate your right to be present at court and trial, which is what they did to Hammond the other day, which is, is quite ironic because by doing so, they completely missed their whole objective. Remember what their objective is, is to ensure that he's at trial and, or at the court at the proper time and place? Yep, yep. And yet they've, and yet he's been in, in jail here for, for 19 months, and, 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 they, and, and then they fail at their objective because of a sideline issue? Yep, yeah, he was in the courthouse. He just wasn't in Queen Navarro's. Well, he wasn't in the courthouse. No, he wasn't in the courthouse. He never left the he never left the jail here in Pahrump. Oh, I was not aware of that. I th so he got stripped three times, and then he got left in Nye County. Correct. Oh, oh. Another day at the Nevada Southern, I suppose. Yep. See now, Nevada Southern. They uh, continue. They they want to blame it on everybody else. It's a it's a it's a it's a ping pong game going on over here. You know they'll say, oh well, we have to. We have a contract with the marshals, and the marshals dictate you know what we do, and and so the marshals are the ones that are requiring all these strip searches. Of course, at at the courthouse, the marshals run the courthouse. You see, so. At the courthouse, I had a conversation with Doyle Decker, who is the the, the chief or the, the head marshal there, and he said, no, that's not our policy. He goes, uh, we don't require all those strip searches. He's like, uh, they, you know, NSDC has proposed a, a policy to us, and we've approved their policy, it's but we... from an inmate facility. We don't mandate that those things be on the policy. So... He has approved the policy, but he's not necessarily mandating the policy. In other words, NSDC could change their policy and still have their policy approved. Hmm. Okay. But then the other thing the jail does, and not just with this, but with other things that we need, they say, oh, well, you got to get a court, uh, you know, get a, get a, uh, a court order from the judge. But then we'll go through the effort to go get a court order from the judge on this thing or that. And the judge was like, oh, I can't tell the jail how to run. And so they ping pong it back and forth, and, and, and we don't have what we need. Nope. But nope. we'll do the same thing with the marshals. Oh, it's the marshals' fault, or the marshals tell us that we have to do it because of the marshals. And then the marshals say, no, it's not us, it's them. Mm -hmm. Ping pong, back and forth, back and forth. In the meantime, our rights are being violated. In the meantime, it takes weeks and weeks to get through any one of these stupid little things. And in the end, we don't get through it anyway. 
and they just continually go on violating men's rights, treating innocent men as though they are guilty, depriving them of, of what is necessary to be able to to uh, to effectively um, defend themselves. But it is it is profitable. You were talking about the Thirteenth Amendment and slavery like you said did have an exception when people go to jail they're either in the olden times they did a lot more work they still do work today there's a whole list of industries out there that profit from subsidized inmate labor the taxpayer pays guys like you pay by you guys suffer the pain taxpayers pay for it you guys suffer the pain but it's a business. Well, whether whether or not we are laboring, whether or not we are producing anything, we are still slaves. We are slaves and because this is involuntary servitude. Am I able to serve my family? Am I able to earn a living for them right now? No. And yet these guys, by having me in their facility, are making money. That's how they make money, by having us here, by contract. They are being paid by the federal government to house us here. For a profit. Therefore, whether or not I do labor for them, I am their slave. Yes. Because I'm not able to serve myself and to serve my family, it is involuntary servitude. I'm serving them. You're feeding their family. Absolutely. And you know what? They readily admit it. You know, we ask, you know, we'll, we'll have a conversation with this guard or that concerning these matters, and they're like, well, I've got to feed my family. Yeah, well, who do you have to think feed mine? You know, mine are living off of the, the good graces and the donations of, 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 of you people out there, which I'm very thankful for. Tell them, tell them very next great. time, tell them next time I fed you first, I raised beef. I used to raise beef. Again? Tell them next time that you fed them first because you're a rancher, you're a farmer, you used to feed them. Yeah. Maybe not, they're probably beyond any reason there well again you know as you noticed at the end of my story story i said we have got to start basing our decisions on correct principles rather than upon their paycheck they are telling me well i've got to feed my family i've got to earn i'm just doing my job i'm just doing my job well your job is stealing the lives of other men and your job is taking from them to provide for yourself they're sold out the devil has bought their souls they're sold out for a weekly paycheck but they can still repent if they want to they can but repentance don't come until they repent it yep. doesn't come automatically. No. Nope. You've got to change. You've yep. got to ask forgiveness. You've got to try to undo the damage you've done. Repentance doesn't happen automatically. Is there anything else you, you would like to cover today, Ryan? Well, again, I don't know what to specifically ask people. I can't, I can't tell you what to do. All I'm telling you... And asking of you is you've got to do something. You can't just run to the pasture and, and consider yourself safe. You've got to be like that brave little lamb. You've got to come back. It's not just us. It's not just me. Yeah, I want to be rescued. I want to come out of this. But it's not just me. There are thousands in my position. And, and you yourselves are in that position and don't even realize it. Yep. You are all slaves out there. Yep. Slave, if, 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 you're, if, you're, if you've got a driver's license, you're a slave. If you're buying a license for this or a permit for that, then you have to ask for every little thing you do, then you're not free. No. Nope. Freedom, free, freedom is, the, is the ability to do what you want to do of your own free will and choice. Now, granted, we cannot violate the, the, the laws of God, and we must um, honor other men's rights by 
by loving our neighbors as ourselves and, and doing unto others as we to have others do unto us. And in the most basic terms, do no harm. We cannot violate God's law. But if we subject ourselves to all of these artificial laws, not natural laws, not common laws, but these man-made, artificial, fabricated junk laws, then you're not free. You're a slave. So nope. wake up, America. Wake up. Realize who you are, that you are a child of God, and that he has sent you here this call to experience is life facility. as a free man. And that freedom is most important. I can't tell you what to do. You're going to have to rely upon the Spirit of the Lord. But you better wake up. Awake to our awful situation. And I tell people, we're not locked up, but we will be eventually. What we allow happen to you guys will eventually be normal. It's history. It's normal. What we allow... It's becoming quite normal now. It's becoming quite normal now. Just like the strip search, you know, they're... They say, oh, well, it's just it's just routine policy. We just strip search everybody, you know, whenever we want, whenever we say. And uh, and if you don't do what we say, then, you know, then, then, then we're going to beat you and we're going to forcefully strip you and we're going to throw you in a cell naked without any clothes or blankets and leave you there for a day and, and let you be really, you know, anyway. Yep, yep. Here's, you know, here's the thing. The only... This is communism again. But the only solution to everything is apply more force. You don't do what we want, apply more force. You don't, if you don't abide by our, our policy, we'll apply more force. That's the solution to everything. Ryan, we're going to... Thank you. We're going to, we're going to have to do this again soon. Okay. Let's... We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. We all have something we need to do. We will figure it out. Well, I want to end with, again, saying thank you to everybody for the support you have been giving and for taking care of my wife and family on the outside. I am so grateful for all the help you've done. Um, but this is not over. We've got to get our freedom back. So thank you, thank you. This is from an inmate facility. All right. Join us next time, America. The shirts that said, I am Eric Parker, I am Ryan Bundy, it's true. What we allow happen to our neighbor will eventually be our fate. You only have to study a little bit of history to see that. Speaking about the collective, eventually it's your turn. So join us next time on the Am and Bundy Facebook page. Reach out to your... Why don't you reach out to the talk radio guys out there? Glenn Beck, Michael Savage, Chad Benson, Joe Pags, any of these guys. Some of them had Ammon and Lavoie on while they were up at the refuge, and then as soon as Lavoie got murdered, they dropped the story and never heard of them. Hold them accountable. You be the news. You make them cover the truth. Anything else is doing a disservice. See you next time. You need to know that sheep are not brave animals. They don't fight back when attacked. When in danger, they just run to, with the greatest of fear and try to escape. They tuck their heads into the flock, trying to hide themselves at the expense of whoever else is on the outside. They never face their fears. That's just sheep. Second of all, Sheep almost always give birth to twins, sometimes three or four or even five, but seldom do sheep give birth to just one. Twins are the norm. I don't know why that is, it's just the way God created them, and most of the time sheep have twins. It's kind of interesting. Third of all, in our corral, at our ranch, we have two large basil trees. Now these trees grow fast, and they grow tall, and they provide good shade for the animals in the corral. But these trees have little integrity. They grow fast but not strong. They are often breaking down in a strong wind or when their weight outgrows their strength. Uh, my story begins 
with the crash of one of these big trees into our corral, a common occurrence that usually does damage to the corral and creates a mess that needs to be cleaned up. This call is from an inmate facility. This particular branch of the tree had fallen into the entrance of the corral from one of our fields that cows and sheep use as pasture. At the time, we had some sheep there. The fallen tree did not completely prevent the sheep from coming in, but they had to jump through the branches to get in or out. The branch had been down for some time, so I decided that today would be a good day to clean it. Terrible fear. He bleated for help, but all the other sheep are not safe in the pasture. But then, from behind me, back from the field, back from safety, back into danger, came another little lamb, his twin brother, I assume. This little lamb came right up into the danger, bleeding for his brother. He went right up to the fallen tree to bring his brother safely out. Getting the attention of the trapped little lamb, he encouraged him. Seeing and hearing his brother through the branches, the little lamb finally gained the courage he needed to go through the fallen branches. Together, they run like hell to the safety of the pasture. Before I started my work, I pondered for a moment the bravery of this second little lamb. The bravery that this lamb must have had to come back into the danger to rescue his brother. Do animals have love for one another? It appeared that this one did. This little lamb had nothing to gain for himself self by going back into the danger zone. He had already gone through it and was safe with the flock, far from the noise in the falling tree, far from harm's way. But he went against his own nature as a fearful creature to go rescue his brother. He knew that he could not conquer the tree nor the chainsaw. And he surely did not understand This call it. is from an inmate facility. But what was really happening? But still he came. Still he came. And by coming, he was able to give his brother the courage he needed to make it through the danger so that he could be safe, too. That story, that took place in, in 1990. Now I want to tell you another true story. A story about my brother Ammon. This story began in the fall of 2015 and is still going on today. This is a story of a very successful man. Everything he touched seemed to turn to gold. Ammon had built a very successful business. He had numerous employees. He married a lovely wife and had six beautiful children. He owned more than one home worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. He owned an apple orchard growing a special variety of apples. He was happy, safe, and successful. Prominent, productive, and prosperous. He had gone through the travails of life to acquire this place, and he was safe in his pasture, so to speak. But then he heard the cry of his brothers, Dwight and Stephen Hammond, who he had never met. They were in peril. Their world was crashing down around them. Ammon at first said to himself, I am busy. I don't have time. I have work enough for myself to do. I don't want to get involved. But then the Spirit of the Lord rested upon him and said, Learn all that you can about the Hammonds. Ammon stayed up all of that night reading everything he could find about the Hammonds. He learned lives. The Lord said to Ammon, regarding what was being done to the Hammonds, I am not well pleased. And you're on. Ladies and gentlemen of America, Ryan Bundy joins you on your lunch break today, live from his maximum security cell, because we have left him there. But Ryan, you are here to talk to us today about the, the specific abusers at the CCA facility. Funded by your tax dollars, America, you're paying for this, you Republicans and you Democrats and all you people that just let other people supposedly take care of your liberty, this is where it all ends up eventually. But you wanted to talk uh, today, Ryan, about the 13th Amendment and everything that's going on with the strip searches that you and Ammon are being subjected to. And they're playing mind games with your brother. They're telling him that you've 
given up and you've surrendered and these guys are these these guys are the terrorists here well before i go into that i have a a, a, a story i want to tell and, and it will lead right into to that discussion that we just can So okay. you guys will uh, you guys will uh, bear with me for a moment. I'll I'll go through this. Now, I'd like you to tell I'd like to tell you that this story is true. It's not a fabrication. I participated in it. This is me that's telling this story to you now. Now, before I go into the story, I need to give a little bit of background to lay a foundation. Now, the story, I'm, I'm calling it The Brave Little Lamb. And first of all, people meet up. So I headed to the corral with the chainsaw. I climbed up into the tree to strategically take it apart from the top down for safety and efficiency. Now, the little band of sheep we had were in the corral, quietly asleep in the shade of the tree when I began my work. I started the chainsaw and cut the first branch, which came crashing down into the ground, closing off the exit even tighter. The sheep went berserk. They all jumped up from their sleep and began running around the crowd trying to find another way out. Having none, one old ewe headed for the fallen tree and threw the branches um, to get out, to, out, out free to the pasture. The rest of the flock quickly followed. I watched and waited and gave them a little time and a chance to get out before I cut my next branch. A few of the little lambs had a hard time overcoming their fear to go through the branches, but all of them made it, except for one. He was now all alone and just could not bring himself to go through that tree that had just fallen from the sky with the noise of the scary chainsaw and a mighty crash. Alone and closed off from his family, he bawled in fear, and he ran around the corral trying to find a way out. A few times he approached the fallen tree, but just could not find the courage within him to go through the branches. I was perched in the tree directly overhead, watching all of this and waiting patiently for him to find his way. The little lamb in terror.